Okay, in this video, we're going to cover 15.6. So this is the surface integrals. So they start off with this integral and they give us our bounds. I'm trying to get this zoomed out enough so that you can see. There we go. Um, so I wrote down the same integral. I wrote down the bounds. Um, X going from zero to five, Y going from zero to four. And so there is a formula to use. Um, it is discussed in the slides. So we're basically taking this and then we're just substituting for Z since I do know what Z is equivalent to. Um, that does end up canceling out the X in the front. So all I have there in that expression is this. Um, and then you do have to do ZX squared plus ZY squared plus one all inside of radical. And um, the derivative of this with respect to X is negative one and the derivative of this with respect to Y since there's no Y's would be zero. So we end up with um, one plus zero plus one, which is a square root of two. So that's where this square root of two came from. Now I just brought that square root of two multiplier out to the very front. And I did integrate this with respect to y. So this became negative y squared plus five y. I plugged in the four, plugged in the zeros, um, and I ended up with um, just positive four. So I integrated this positive four with respect to x, and I got four x to be evaluated from zero to five. And so when I plugged in five and zero, I ended up with 20. So I got square root of two times 20, which was 20 square root of two. For number two, very, very similar. So I replaced the Z with what they gave me for Z. I combined my like terms together. And that was the expression I got here in the front. For the radical, we had to do the derivative with respect to X, which is negative eight, the derivative with respect to Y, which was positive eight. And then of course they did give me my bounds for both X and Y. So I have them there for Y and for X. So I get the square root of eight, negative eight squared plus eight squared plus one. 64 plus 64 plus one is where this 129 came from. It is just a constant multiplier. So I kicked it out to the very front and I did integrate these terms with respect to Y first. So I got 17 Y minus seven X Y plus three Y squared over two to be evaluated from zero to five for Y. So I plugged in the fives. I got these things. I plugged in the zero. Remember all these numbers are getting substituted for Y. So X is staying X, okay? Um, I combined my like terms and I ended up with the radical on the outside, 245 over two minus 35 X. I did take the integral of that with respect to X and ended up with these two terms, plugged in the threes and the zero. I ended up with these two numbers, combined those two numbers and that should not be an equal sign. It should just be multiplied. Um, I ended up with this value and then, um, I went ahead and multiplied that by, we'll reduce this and multiplied it by the square root of 129. And I ended up with that final value. Um, now for number three, very similar, but they didn't give me my bounds explicitly, okay? So, and I noticed that it was a circle because it was x squared um, plus y squared less than or equal to one. So it's essentially the inside of a circle, okay? Now they did give me z and it was four. So I replaced the Z with four, um, but I also noticed that since it was a circle, I chose to use polar coordinates other than using radicals. Um, so I did R would go from zero to one because it's the radius has to be less than one. Um, and then zero, my theta, since it's the whole circle would be from zero to two pi. Now the derivative of this with respect to R or X, so you could have done the partials with respect to either. If you do the, the partials with respect to X, you have to convert those later, you know, with respect to X and with respect to Y, then convert them into polar later, okay? Or you can just take Z, since they're, you can convert it into polars right away, but that one doesn't have anything. There's no X and there's no Y, so nothing needs to get converted to polar. Um, and so then you can take that uh, partial with respect to R and theta right away, since I didn't need to convert it, okay? If this had X's and Y's in it, I would have to convert the X's to R cosine theta 
and the y's to r sine theta before I could take the partials with respect to r and with respect to theta. It just so happened it was a constant, so I didn't converting it would have made it exactly the same. Okay, so it's got zero and zero. So then I have x, which is r cosine theta minus two r sine theta plus four, and then zero squared plus zero squared plus one, all under the radical. Now we are integrating polar coordinates, so I do have to have that Jacobian r dr d theta. Now, um, now this is just the square root of one, which is one. So you notice that the radical is completely gone in the next step. Um, and then I did go ahead and take this r and distribute it to these guys, okay? Um, and then if I integrate that, I get r cubed over three. If I integrate this r, I get r cubed over three. And if I integrate that r, I end up with two r squared. I plugged in the ones and the zeros and I ended up with these three terms. Then I took the integrals with respect to d theta. So this became one third sine theta, this became positive two thirds cosine, and this became two theta. Then I evaluated it from two pi to zero. So I plugged in two pi, got these three, plugged in zero, and I got these three, and then I combined my like terms, and I actually ended up with four pi. Again, you can pause it, so you can analyze that a little bit deeper if you need to, but I wanna keep moving forward. So number four, um, they're wanting us to find the flux, okay? So they give us this um, thing here. Now they start to talk about the upward normal vector. And so if you do this, um, it will cover you for all of the um, upward unit normal vectors, okay? Um, so essentially it's the same process for all three of these problems, except I didn't wanna do number five because it doesn't have anything in there that's algorithmically generated. Although this does look like a circle over here. So you probably would want to use polar coordinates for number five, okay? I would do this first and figure out what this dot product looks like and then put the polar, everything in polar coordinates. That's just me, that's my suggestion, but I would do all the stuff in X's and Y's first and then convert it into polar coordinates before you actually put the bounds and all of that, okay? So my um, vector field is an eight Z negative five Y and then Z is one minus X minus Y. Since I'm talking about the first octant, I'm talking about Z going from zero to that um, plane. And then for y, the z would be zero. So this would be zero. And then I would move the y over. And so that line is y equals one minus x. So the bounds are going from zero to one minus x. And then the x values are going from zero to one. And that's where we got these bounds from, okay? Now, to get that um, this thing here, we have to let g equal z minus g of x, y. So um, we have z minus, you basically are just solving this for z. I, you don't even need to write that. You're just getting this equal to zero. So it's z minus one plus x plus y equal to zero. And then this is your g, okay? Um, and so you notice that that's exactly what I have there defined as g, okay? Then when you have G, you're gonna do the gradient. So the derivative of this with respect to X is one, derivative of this with respect to Y is one, and the derivative of this with respect to Z is one, okay? Um, so then when I do the dot product, it's gonna be um, my vector value function, but it has to be in terms of X and Y. So we have Z, which is gonna get replaced by this. Mm -hmm. Then you have minus five, and then you have Y. And then you have to do it the dot product with the ones. So we're gonna end up with this and I went ahead and distributed the eight times one. So it's just those three terms with the eight distributed. Then, um, oh, it doesn't look like I did the dot product yet. I just distributed the eight. Now I'm gonna do the dot product. So it's this whole term times one, which is what you've got here, plus this term times one, plus a negative is the same as minus. And then this times this term, so plus a y. 
Um, I did have some like terms. So these guys together made three, um, 8x is still 8x. And then these two together made negative 7y. So it was three minus 8x minus 7y. And I integrated each with respect to y. So I got 3y minus 8xy minus 7y squared over 2. I plugged in my bounds and I got these three terms. Um, I factored out the common 1 minus x and I ended up with 3 minus 8x minus 7 halves times the extra 1 minus x. I did distribute the negative 7 over 2 and I did combine my like terms in here and I ended up with this constant and this many x's. Um, I also went ahead and just foiled this all out and combined my like terms. And so after I foiled it out and combined my like terms, I ended up with this. And then I integrated each term. Then I plugged in my bounds one to zero and it just turned out to equal negative one. Again, if you need to slow it down and pause so that you can foil this and combine your like terms to see where that came from, please do. But I will be moving on. So number five, I leave for you because there's no algorithmically generated part in there. But number six, I did do, okay? So number six would be, um, okay, so this thing is actually a sphere. I mean, I could put it what it is, right? But it's a sphere with a radius of four. And since I'm in the first octant, I only want the top half of that sphere, right? Where the Z is positive. And I only want what's above the xy plane, okay? Or top half is above the xy plane. But in the xy plane, I also want to be in the first quadrant. That's what makes me in the first octant. It's the, the first quadrant in the xy plane, but then above um, that xy plane. So because I'm going to be above the xy plane, I am taking the positive radical, okay? And so if I subtract this over to get it equal to zero, that's what g of x is equal to, okay? Now, if I want to know what's going on in the xy plane, I made the z zero. I went ahead and I squared both sides and I ended up with this. I went ahead and added the x, y, the x squared and y squared to the other side. This is just a circle with a radius of four. So you end up with these bounds here. Now, it's only in the first quadrant because it said the first octant. So in here, your r is going from 0 to 4, but your theta is only going from 0 to pi over 2 to give me just the first um, uh, quadrant there. Now, the hard part here is going to be this g, um, the gradient of g. So I have to take the derivative of this with respect to x, then the derivative of this with respect to y, and then the derivative of this with respect to z, OK? And so again, you can look over this. I re just rewrote this as parentheses with a one half exponent. So the one half, um, well, there's a negative in front. So there's the negative. The one half comes down, the base stays the same, the exponent decreases by one. One half minus one is negative one half. Then you multiply by the derivative of what's inside. I'm doing the derivative with respect to x. So the derivative would be negative two x. Then we're gonna do the same thing, but with respect to y. So the negative again is there, the one half would come down, you decrease the power by one, and then you take the derivative of this with respect to y. And then when you do the derivative with respect to z, this has no z's in it, so it's just zero. And the, the derivative of z with respect to z is just one. So this negative and this negative cancel, this two and this two cancel. So all I have is x in the top, and since this is a negative exponent, the radicals downstairs. Here, negative and negative is positive, two and two cancel. And this goes downstairs as a house. So you have y on top with that house and then comma one. Now it would be best to use the polar coordinates. So um, I did convert both f and g into polar coordinates. So look at f and then the next component. And then that guy, right, is this. But remember these guys are x squared plus y squared is r squared. So I just factored out the negative and then I would have x squared plus y squared. So it's minus r squared. Um, now, g would be r cosine theta over 16 minus r squared, r sine theta over 16 minus r squared, and a one is a one. 
So when I put these in to do my dot product, here's the F terms, here's the gradient of G terms. And then I did this guy times this guy. So I ended up with the square over the house, this guy times this guy. So that squared over house, this times this, so just the house, okay? Um, and then here I did go ahead and get one giant fraction since um, these two guys have R squared, cosine squared plus R squared sine squared. That uh, sum is just R squared. So I combined these two first into this, okay? And then this term just came down. But then I tried to get a common denominator. So that denominator, I multiplied top and bottom. So I'm not changing the value of this um, entity here. But when I do a house times a house, the house will go away. And now since both of them will have that at the bottom, you can put them together with that same bottom. So I have this numerator plus these things squared, which is just 16 minus R squared. So the R squareds end up canceling. I end up with 16 only over this, okay? And don't forget the R, DR, D theta that's been sitting there the whole time, right? So now it's really 16 R over this, okay? So then I um, actually did U substitution. So U was inside the radical. Then du was just negative two r dr, so I divided both sides by negative two. So I had 16, um, now remember the r dr, r dr is gonna become du over negative two, so that's that there. And then the inside of the house becomes u. So I simplified that, that became negative eight u to the negative one half du, so I got negative eight times u to the positive one half times the reciprocal of one half. Um, and I did have to back sub before I could plug in those r's. So I put back what u was. And negative eight times two is where this negative 16 came from. Okay, and then u went back in there and then I evaluated it at zero and four. So I got negative 16 and then zero minus four, which turned into positive 64. And the integral of positive 64 is just 64 theta. And I evaluated that theta from zero to pi over two. So I got 64 times pi over two, which ended up being 32 pi. Um, again, you can always pause this if you need to dissect that a little bit more, especially the algebra in there. I'm pretty nifty when it comes to algebra, but not everyone is. So it might take a little bit longer to like simplify all of that, but it was very much needed because without simplifying that, I think I would have had a really tough time trying to integrate it, okay? But that is the end of 15.6.